Välkomna till det här samtalet mellan konstnären Akinbåde Akinbeji och kuratorn Ulrika Frink. Ett samtal som Västerås konstmuseum spelar in online som en introduktion av Akinbejis utställning som pågår just nu på Västerås konstmuseum och fram till den 4 april 2021. Just nu så pågår ett fördjupande arbete kring det fotografiska mediet på Västerås konstmuseum under det här året. Och och något som gestaltar sig i ett antal olika utställningar som visar olika typer av fotografi och belyser hur konstnärer använder sig av mediet på olika sätt. Under 2021 så visar vi bland annat utställningen någon sorts kunskap som belyser foto ur och avsamlingar. Men nu, det dokumentära gatu, gatufotografiet har, varit i, har haft huvudrollen i två utställningar. Som båda har kurerats av Ulrika Flink som vanligtvis är konstnärlig ledare på Konstans och i år är även kurator för Borås skulpturbiennal. Dels så visar vi utställningen med den, med den lokala västerås fotografen Kjell-Åke Jansson och dels utställningen som vi nu ska fördjupa oss i Akinbo och Akinbeji, måttet på stadens vägar, några fotografier av Lagos, Bamako, Johannesburg. Uh, and now I'd like to uh, hand over the word to Ulrika Flink with a very warm welcome to both of you. And I look very much forward to hearing your conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Katrin, for uh, that kind introduction and um, for the great uh, collaboration that um, led to the, these two exhibitions that you mentioned. And thank you very much to you, Akinbode Akinbindi, for agreeing to this conversation and, of course, agreeing to exhibit in um, Västerås. Uh, so I would start with uh, maybe telling the audience a little bit, a little background um, of your work. Um, so Akinbode Akinbi is a photographer, curator, educator and writer. You have been focusing on sprawling megacities and especially those on the African continent in your work. Wandering, or, um, you've been wandering cities like uh, Lagos, Addis Adeba, Bamako, Dakar, Cairo and Johannesburg. Some of the cities will of course be shown in the, in the exhibition that is now up for, that is now shown in Västerås. And through these wanderings you're um, it seems like you're searching for moments of um, everyday poetry and your work um, uh, photography practice has been shown all around the world. In, nine, in uh, 2017 you were invited to join Documenta 14 in Castle and Athens and you recently had a solo exhibition called Six Songs Swirling Gracefully in the Taut Air at Martin Gruppius Bau in Berlin. You originally wanted to become a lecturer at university in the subjects of English and literature, but your plans changed and you have been a professional photographer since the end of 1970s. I know there was a certain um, experience that you had while um, photographing that you have some in some um, online discussions described as um, sort of a mind blowing art experience. And I thought it could be uh, interesting to perhaps start in that in start in such in such an uh, such a such an experience and um, I guess that early on inspired you and showed you the power of art and what I'm talking about is um, your visit with your friend to Festac in Lagos um, that was uh, in Lagos and across Nigeria in 1977. So perhaps you could we could start talking about what kind of event that was and how uh, how that uh, event has impacted your way of thinking about art and uh, the power of art. Thank you very much, Ulrika, especially for this very kind intro. So to go way back, this is about, I don't know how many years ago, 1977. <laughs> yeah. And, um, it was a very big event. It was um, the second actually um, uh, cultural event of black peoples from all over the world in Africa called Festac, Festac 1977, and it was a huge um, uh, 
what's the word, uh, enterprise, and, and was very, very expensive. <laughs> Thereafter, no, no more took place. But this particular one was really um, huge. And peoples of um, African descent came from all over the world, from Europe, of course, from the North and South Americas, and um, of, of course, from Africa, from all over the continent. And it involved all the, all the arts, uh, visual arts, performance arts, and also cultural um, activities like um, there was a Durba in, in the north of Nigeria with um, uh, it's a kind of um, celebration of the king at, at particular um, times of the year where um, horse riders ride towards the king in full um, at full stampede, so to speak, and then hold um, a break just before him. And there's also some um, water festivals from the southeast of, of Nigeria which were done in Lagos, but also in the southeast of Nigeria as well. So um, I went there, as you said, with my very close childhood friend, Jide Adeni Jones, also a photographer. And um, it sort of um, made me realize, first of all, the importance of photographing, and also that photographs actually, just like with writing or you know, um, reports, journalistic reports, also tell a story, have a narrative. So that was really the, so to speak, um, most sort of, um, how can I put it, um, the most uh, initially, so the beginning of my own photographic um, career. That career has, of course, been uh, going strong ever since. And uh, we have uh, several of your ongoing series on view in the exhibition, The Measure of City Pathways, some photographs from Lagos, Bamako, Johannesburg that we're going to talk about today and um, you have a very particular eye for unpacking these uh, hectic uh, mega cities that finding uh, both uh, intimate moments uh, uh, that sort of highlights the undercurrent of urban landscapes. Could you perhaps uh, describe uh, the fundamental questions that are at play in an exhibition as uh, the measure of the city pathways in Westeros. Uh, these, um, these sort of broad, uh, ongoing investigations of urban cities, uh, what would you say are the fundamental questions that you are posing to yourselves, to yourself? So um, Ulrika, when I start out um, on my wanderings, which is usually almost every day, um, I try not to have any questions, actually. I try to be as open-minded, as um, open-sighted as possible. That, that, that means I so go out of the front door and just engage with the city. Of course, I do have questions. Huh? So questions as to what is going to happen today, what, what am I going to see, and also very much also trying to understand my environment. So the immediate environment, be it Johannesburg or Bamako or Lagos or where I live presently in Berlin. And the idea is to just wander as, as um, non-judgmental, as freely as possible to relax. I often call it a dance, but it's a dance not with another um, phys uh, human being, but with the city itself. Huh? So trying to understand the city, to move with the city, so to speak. And then mm. there, there are certain moments where things come together. Threads, like the, we're all constantly weaving threads. We don't often see them, but then they come to, to a fruition at a certain moment. And that's what I really then hopefully try to take, make an image at that particular moment. These are my own personal threads, which I'm weaving ahead of me, but also the threads of, of fellow passers-by, people who are on the streets or in vehicles, you know, up in the air, all kinds of stuff. Of course, the architecture, the street, the way the streets, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, their, their pathways, all kinds of stuff. So I try not to limit myself, as I said before. I try not to have immediate questions. I mean, the, the deeper questions have to do with, yeah, where are we going? And what is happening within the city? What is... How is it evolving? How is it taking shape? So these are some of the fundamental, deeper-seated questions, which are there, but I, I don't try to put them in the, in the foreground. Hmm. You've been also talking about how hearing 
is a central part of your photographic process uh, and how you approach um, the city, these cities. Can you perhaps tell us more about that? Um, for me, hearing is so important. I think, or oh, I claim as a kind of mantra almost, we see more with the ears than with the eyes in the sense that um, radiations, um, these threads are actually very tonal and we, you can with time begin to hear them and uh, um, listen, listening in, um, begin to understand where they're coming from. So for example, um, I go out and I listen to conversations, but just by in passing by, I don't actually try to um, listen in to what they're saying, but I get um, fragments of conversations. And sometimes you, I hear something about something happening, some, some, maybe there's some sales going on, or this particular market has opened, has just opened up, or somebody um, is sick, like now, of course, with the, um, with the um, pandemic. Uh, or, or, so, and then it sort of almost literally directs my, my, my sight and also my path within the city. So sometimes if I hear of something, I might go there, things like that. But mm -hmm. also, of course, there um, is the wind, very powerful force within cities, of course, but also in the countryside. And then uh, it's very, very subtle. It's like sometimes this morning, for example, was a first in a long time where we've had sunshine. Huh? And I woke mm -hmm. up quite early and then the cars were moving and they were moving in a kind of way which wasn't of late recently because we had gray days. People seemed to be somehow depressed. But today there was a kind of dynamism, a kind of, um, I can't know how to put it quite, but a kind of vibe, let's say, a vibration in the air, which I try to listen into. This, this means, of course, going out onto the city streets myself and then just meandering my way towards a particular um, goal, a particular sit, um, place within the city and just listening in. And of course, the eyes too are there and the, the eyes, the ears. Um, the smells as well, and tasting, feeling. So they all come together. But I really l loved and tried to prioritize the ears. And I also, also claim that the ears are the first um, sensorial organs in the uh, mother's womb um, of the baby, which are, are formed uh, before the eyes. <laughs> so so this, um, this way of being uh, very, I guess, in your body, embodied experience of, of the, walking the streets. Um, does that also, I mean, through the years, you've been doing this now for decades. Um, how have you sort of learned how to navigate uh, difficult situations? I mean, there's in cities and especially mega cities, there's always different uh, areas. Uh, some are more safer than others. Uh, or some people might not be so happy being, um, you know, being in a photograph. So I'm just wondering how you're, um, how you're managing these um, things that come in your way while you're wandering these cities. So what I always say to uh, younger colleagues uh, who I sometimes mentor or, or teach is just to, as far as possible, relax. So don't be afraid. Don't be scared of any part of the city and go wherever you want to go. I mean, it's easy said, it's not often possible because some um, cities can be very, very rough, very, very sort of um, so-called no, literally almost no go areas, especially if you're a person of color or even, um, even more challenging sometimes for women, of course. But um, over the years, over the decades, you learn to have your own rhythm, your own, so like you said, embodied movement in, within the city. And then you realize that you can carry or, or move in such a way that um, people are not actually, they, they don't feel challenged by you. They don't actually even acknowledge you or see you as such. And you, I just walk through certain areas and you can, with time, learn how to take, make photographs if, if that's what you want to do. So um, it's a matter of, again, relaxing. So really just just and not being afraid at all and just moving as quietly and as gently as possible through all kinds of different urban spaces. Hmm. Time to time, and it still happens, people do challenge me. 
um, they feel somehow I should not be here, like especially for for example, because I'm I'm black, for example, and I'm possibly might be in a so-called neo-fascist um, area or whatever it is, or um, I, I don't belong in the area. This happens as well. This kind of um, territorial territorial um, uh, had, um, challenging that. What are you doing in my in our area? You don't belong here. But um, even that, you learn to negotiate and to move forward or just you know just take them on at times huh? so maybe two years ago i was in chicago in some african-american neighborhoods which are quite challenging because of um poverty um drug dealing unfortunately still and sometimes people come up to me and asking me um do you want to buy drugs and i would i would just you know look at them and say no or not um, you know nod my head that i'm not into that at all and then just move forward and they more or less hopefully respect me huh? So I think it's important to move actually with a, a, a kind of respectful demeanor and um, um, manner in your movements. Huh? So I try not to be arrogant or try to feel cocksure or anything like that, just very, very quietly. It is, though, as I say, it's always a challenge and there's always something um, new around the corner. So sometimes mm -hmm. you come across like, like say a robbery or people fighting, <laughs> or whatever it is, or sometimes terrible accidents, then you have to decide what to do. Mm -hmm. So recently I was even talking to my sister who works in the emergency services. What does the one actually do if you come across somebody bleeding profusely? Eh? How to stop the bleeding? Or if somebody's having a heart attack or a, a, a stroke, what do you do? Eh? And things like that, actually, because these sometimes you are the only one there or you come up across that person initially. Eh? So things like that. Eh? So it's always... But yeah, it's part of my, um, actually it's a part of my daily wandering, so to speak. But fortunately, these don't happen often. Huh? So, and most times people are really very gracious and gen are also respectful to one, just like I try to be to others. Huh? So um, when I invited you to do your first solo exhibition in, uh, in Westeros, you were just in the process of, um, soon to open your large uh, solo in Berlin at Martin Gruppius Bau. So I'm just, um, yeah, I'm sort of curious about um, if you would like to tell us a little bit about the approach to the exhibition in Westeros, because we, of course, and um, have a, uh, yeah, a like you have one room instead of several rooms, and uh, you're working with, um, your grids of the images by 60 by 60. So if you would like to tell us how you, from an er, from the from the starting point, um, think when you're building a new exhibition. Um, it was very much in conversation with you, Ulrika. <laughs> and then um, once we decided which bodies of work we would like to have in um, Fasteros, we then um, prioritized which images. And then I realized it's just one big room, a very nice room. And then I start um, thinking about this, huh? thinking and working almost subliminally, so, such that I would go to bed and sleep, waking up in the mornings, think about how is it going to take shape, which images, what is the sequence, this kind of thing. And um, it takes, sometimes it can go very quickly. Sometimes I try, uh, it takes a bit longer. And then um, all the time, I'm very much for equilibrium, balance, so that the images together sing. But um, this is again coming into listening in, but um, it's, it's an open-ended thing. So sometimes they can sing this way or sing that way. It depends also on, on the room itself or the walls. So I'm very much into that, very, um, uh, um, trying to, cons to see the, uh, the, the finished product even before it's finished in, in the sense of how it's going to be exhibited exhibited and, and then there are things like um the grids and the images in in a, a single line and sequences and i'm very much into time to tell a story with individual bodies of work but the, all the bodies of work together as one particular story and hopefully mm. The visitors come into the space, the room, they can go to their left or the right, they can just go into the middle, but already they begin to look at and listen to the story. And um, I think that 
um, if we start with looking at the photographer's end exhibition from your hometown, Lagos, a city that you've been uh, photographing since, I don't know, the 60s maybe, making narratives of this uh, super mega city who constantly seems to be on the move. So um, this particular image was made about almost, oh, actually almost 20 years ago, 2004. It's on Lagos Island, um, um, Lagos. Lagos is this, um, now a, around 20, above 20 million um, inhabitant city. And it's a series of islands and then the uh, mainland, the first, the, um, the first land. And um, this particular day, in fact, I went to the building to the left here, which is an old Brazilian building in the sense that it was built by returnees um, from Brazil in the, um, who returned from Brazil as freed slaves in the late 1880s, 1890s and um, came back to the West African coast, settled not necessarily where they were had been enslaved from, but usually in the port cities, in Lagos, for example, and because uh, they had learned in Brazil um, particular trades, especially in building trades, they started building buildings. Huh? So this is one of the iconic Brazilian buildings in Lagos for, uh, for maybe about almost 100 years. Huh? Very beautiful building, and I was I'm, I'm looking. We're I'm standing. I'm looking at the, from the side, huh? and in the distance you can see um, um, high rises from the central business district of Lagos Island. And um, I had just been inside this building, I think, for the first time. Huh? So we had been interviewing some of the people living in the building on the first floor. You can see here a little bit of balconies with um, iron um, railings very beautifully wrought, um, uh, beautifully, um, uh, what's the word, manufactured from, uh, from about the 30s or the 40s or the 20s already of the 20th century. So this building was really a wonderful building. Huh? Unfortunately, it was pulled down about four or five years ago illegally. So now there's a, just a building, um, an empty plot there at the moment. Huh? So now after leaving this building on that particular day, I was just um, taking, making some photographs and then um, from the from the side of from the side road, so to speak, not frontally, but the side road. And um, in that moment, this um, young girl was passing by, and she knew I was taking making a photograph, and she was laughing. Some people think she's almost crying, huh? but she was actually laughing in this particular moment uh, in going by. Huh? And important for me in this image is the um, coming together of very many different threads, architectural threads threads of um, advertising, these um, signs like the rubber stamp, plastic um, um, identity cards, typing and lamination, and then also the wires, which was um, is still done in Lagos, unfortunately. People don't necessarily have access to um, this, the central electrical grid, so they tap from um, their posts outside, um, so send up wires, uh, which can be very, very dangerous. And then you see some, um, at the moment, empty stands huh, in, the, in the foreground. So I love this particular image because it shows something of the, I call it um, density and um, intensity of Lagos. It's, it's a very dense city, a very intense city, and it's constantly on the move, as you said, Amorika. It's constantly evolving, constantly um, taking, um, finding new ways to, to show itself. You, of course, grew up in Lagos um, and you've seen the transformation of uh, the city over, um, you know, uh, I don't know, is it 50 odd years? Um, yeah. So would you like to maybe talk about um, the Lagos of your or the streets of your childhood and how how that um, sort of mission of returning to those streets in a sense um, underpins your whole um, project um, with this ongoing documentation or this ongoing, not documentation, ongoing, um, you know, project of, uh, of uh, making images in Lagos. Mm -hmm. So it is a very um, personal engagement with the city. Um, I wasn't born there. I was born in Oxford, um, or something Christine said, but I grew up in Lagos and I went to school, especially primary school in Lagos. Just like these two young boys, I think they were coming back from school actually, 
because it was, this photograph was taken in the early afternoon, just around the, um, well, not quite some distance from the first image we looked at. Again, in the, uh, in the background or the middle ground, you, this building here, you see a, another example of a much smaller Brazilian building. Huh? You can notice a little of the decorations on the window, this kind of thing here as well. So now, um, I like what you said, Ulrike, because I'm always in trying to understand cities, or especially Lagos, I'm trying to understand myself, of course, and this takes me back to my, into my past, into my childhood. So just like these two young boys coming back from home from school, I too sometimes would walk back home from school, not in this part of Lagos, we lived somewhere else, so also quite nearby, but just like them too, we're going back home. Huh? And um, what um, drew me to this particular image initially was the um, Brazilian house. I've known it for years actually here. It's now run down, it's still there. I was there recently again, it was still there. But also the um, broken down um, uh, uh, three-wheeled, uh, it's a taxi actually, three-wheeled um, vehicle. And then the boys happened to come into the image. I saw them coming and then I waited for them and they came in together. So there's always this kind of movement, engagement with the city, in this particular case with Lagos, and a kind of, as I said again, trying to listen in into the city. I mean, the boys were actually not talking at that particular moment, but all around me is, is the sound of, the, of traffic, of, of other people talking. And photography is very fragmentary, especially the type of photography I do. So it's, it's, it's a nanosecond, a fragment, but says a lot and, and, and narrates a lot. And um, many people looking at this image, they have not been to Lagos, can't fully read it. But others, the more they look at it, they begin to understand certain signs and codes. For example, again, this is this um, uh, post here. Oh, and you see a little bit of the wires coming down from the post. But in this, just in the front of the house, you see this um, is a kind of cart where um, it's used normally to um, transport water um, 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 casks to sell water, fresh water, or not fresh water, but um, so-called clean water for bathing or for cooking. So these are the kind of little details which are very much embedded in the images. And you look at them and hopefully look at them and um, begin to hear the tonalities coming forth from the images. Yes, and uh, the city that, you know, Lagos in this image, and uh, um, I'm thinking about the economic situation, um, is very different from when you grew up and how, how Lake, the state of Lagos looked back then. Is that very correct? So, yeah, very, very much so. This particular area of the city, when I was, like the age of these boys, was very, very clean, very quiet, and there was hard, had very, very few buildings were run down like now. So this is, I'm talking about the 50s, the 60s, yeah, the 50s especially, very quiet, very well ordered. There was a, um, uh, what do you call it? There was a, a town um, council, so the town um, administration had what they call the PWD, Public Works Department. They made sure the streets were clean, well ordered, and things functioned. There was water supply. There was none of this, um, uh, what's the word, um, trying to um, illegally um, take um, um, uh, electricity from these, um, nothing like that. Everything was well ordered. But in the 50s, we were still a colony of Britain. So it was actually very much a kind of British way of governing the colonies. Very, very um, discriminating against us, the um, the indigenes. But um, unfortunately, then things function better than they do nowadays. Huh? Although, again, now I mean, this, and also, by the way, in the fifties, the city was maybe half a million to a million inhabitants. Today, mm -hmm. it's over twenty million. So it, it's really expanded and exploded, and it's very, very difficult for um, present-day um, administrations, so local administrations. To, to manage the city well. They are trying though, and we've had some very, very innovative and good governors of Lagos City and also of Lagos State trying to get things together, but it's very, very difficult. Mm. 
This image was made on the um, on the mainland of of, of um, Lagos, and it's an area called Oshodia. And at that time, this was around um, 2004 as well. Um, it, it's, it's one of the major um, uh, north, south, east, west um, nodal points in the city. And you can see already, I'm, I'm, I'm standing on a footbridge, looking down on the traffic, going north to um, south, or north to south, or south to north. And in the distance, you can see perhaps, no, no, you, you can't, because I, I'm only focusing on the north-south um, ve ve vehicle traffic. Uh, very, very dense. I mean, you see people here on the side of, of, of the, um, on the on sidewalks, uh, on, the, on the buses, smaller buses, bigger buses. Very, very dense. And there's also a big, huge market. And you, here you can't see it, but there's also a railway line. It's still there. And now, today, I was there um, last year, so 2020 in October, November. It's totally changed. Huh? We modernized. There's a huge um, bus terminus there now. So this this kind of but the buses are still here a bit, but much much less. And things are, you would say, modernized. They're functioning better. Things are moving. So that's why this city is so interesting because it's constantly evolving, constantly changing. Huh? I'm so very happy that I was able to make these images then and continued over the years till today. So I'm very, very happy about this. And here, too, you see the density and um, intensity of the city. Many people find this particular um, area of the city very <laughs> conflictual, you know, the, um, petty th uh, thievery, criminals, all kinds of other stuff going on. But I've been going for years and I've learned also, um, you learn how to carry yourself, how to move within this particular um, environment. And sometimes also it can be challenging taking or making photographs because um, like um, we call them area boys. These are young men usually, some older men too, but they're no longer boys, huh? who feel this is their hood, their neighborhood, and they actually, um, come to the to the market space, um, places to get um, some kind of money from market um, um, sellers. If the sellers don't want to give them, it's a kind of tax. Huh? If the sellers don't want to give, they, they, they throw their stuff away. And so if they see someone taking photographs, they come to you as well, ask you what you're doing. And if you don't give them a, you know, a, a, an adequate answer, they might take your camera away, might start beating you up. But what they really want is just money. So that's how they give, actually. They... It's a kind of um, informal taxation. <laughs> and yeah. you learn how to deal with them too as well. So this is the, yeah, this is the kind of things. But I mean, I just go there and do my, I do my work mostly. And then over the years, as I've got older as well, with my gray share now, people give me more respect and I can move more or less very, very freely. Mm. So, and so this is, yeah. I'm thinking um, in many of your images, there is these, uh, traffic uh, points or uh, you know heavy trafficked uh, roads as well as you know the presence of the of the minibus so would you just if if you've never been to any major city in in, in africa um could you just like talk about the the minibus and and the importance of that uh, that the, form of transportation yeah i mentioned it a bit earlier that um Cities like Lagos, especially in the global south, are very difficult to, to govern, to administrate, because they're constantly evolving. Literally every day, hundreds of people are coming in from the countryside, from the other countries as well, into the city. So, and then they need um, transport, of course, and um, places to live. So there's a lot of slums, development, and so on. So it's very difficult to administrate. The minibuses in Lagos, especially, are in private hands, and they try to solve some of the, traf um, the um, transport problems. Huh? And they're um, they're quick. Sometimes the the drivers are very young and um, um, drive dangerously, so sometimes terrible accidents. The bigger buses too; they, they don't drive so uh, fast. They take more passengers. They're a bit cheaper, but they don't. Um, they're not not as quick. Huh? And okay. but what really draws me to the streets and especially to, um, uh, what do you call them, crossroads, huh? is um, there's always something happening on the streets, huh? always, huh? no matter anywhere in the world, and especially at crossroads. Because when you come to crossroads, 
then you have to choose. Do I go left or right, backwards or forwards? And um, of course, I mean, if you're in a bus, I mean, the bus driver decides for you or you know where the bus is going. But um, for some people, pedestrians becomes quite challenging, which is the way now. And this happens a lot in Lagos. Even if people don't know their way around the city, it's so very interesting. So I often um, hang around, wander around crossroads and on streets as well, um, waiting for such moments where I see confusion, contusion, almost sometimes chaos, but also sometimes this density, intensity, and then as a, again, like here, strive to take, make images. So it's a kind of trying to understand the underlying principles, the underlying uh, vibrations of what is happening. Very <laughs> interestingly, many peoples have um, myths and legends and knowledge, which are embedded in these myths and legends about roads, pathways, passageways, especially of crossroads. So my people, the Yorubas, we say there is always at the crossroads a kind of um, deity, a being, waiting for offerings. And then um, those who come with their offerings will ask this deity, which way should I go? It's, so decision time. Eh? So am I going in the right way? Should I go to the left, to the right? Should I go back home? Should I move forward into the future? This kind of thing. And the deity, the especially Elegba, Elegba yeah, he will say, it's up to you. So it's so fascinating. Huh? Whereas, I mean, you have other um, deities who give you other advice and so on. Or nowadays, of course, we rely on, um, on traffic signs. Huh? <laughs> so it's so fascinating. Huh? But the traffic signs for me are also a form of, of trying to come to grips with, with my surroundings, with my path. What I mentioned at the beginning, with the threads which we, are, we all are constantly weaving huh? forwards. Because you can't actually, you, you can't, try to weave backwards, but what has already happened is more or less immalleable. You can't change it, huh? although some people think you can, huh? but you can't really. But the present, you're, you're in it, and the future is already is beginning to take shape. That is what we can possibly um, manipulate, change, or you ask these deities, these beings, which way do I move forward? So that's why passageways and crossroads uh, from, and of course, um, spaces, urban spaces, spaces in the countryside, and of course now, and this is a particular image. It's I'm showing you, um, the the viewers, um, many, many, many spaces within one space, so to speak. So in, in, if you go inside into this image, you see you can go inside the buses if you want to, and it's a whole world in in and of itself. So there's so many things in this particular image happening. Uh, I like these kind of images so much because you can look at them for decades and you haven't seen enough. So this is in the same area on the ground now, um, taken another time. And these are three women furious with a bus conductor. And there's a big problem about um, you, you pay the fare, getting your change back. And I, I suspect, I, if, I, if, I'm, if I remember rightly, these women were arguing with the bus conductor about getting their small change back. Huh? Because we often now, you have notes, you have notes, and then they don't have enough change in their pockets, the bus conductors, to give you um, your, your change back, huh? the, the change for your, for your fare. So then this becomes a big argument. Huh? And I came up, up, up across this particular um, moment and made this image from the hip, so to speak. I didn't bring the camera up to my face because if I had done that, they might have noticed me and got even more angry with me. Yeah. <laughs> also, um, it's, for me, it's not just the, the ladies, it's also the background. You see the houses and you see again this um, electrical pole with the uh, wires. This time, these are more or less legal wires now. And this is the kind of thing. Um, as I said, I was. this was again at about 15, 20 years ago. I was here recently again. It's it's much more, um, it's quieter now. I mean, there's I mean, still a lot of buzz, but this kind of things are much, much less now. Everybody's moving more or less like, they move here in Berlin or, or in New York or, so, or in London. So it's so fascinating for me how cities all over the world, not just enough, are constantly changing, constantly evolving. What would you, um, um, one thing that I was thinking about when I saw this image, um, 
this photograph is also like the everyday stresses of living in a mega city and having to um, you know navigate uh, all the people that you encounter that that this that this image could also like be a sign of uh, yeah having to negotiate that stress i guess very much so um it's a stress i understand and um many of us in the cities be it here in berlin or in lagos or in um chicago um um, um, succumb to the stresses eh? and we get we really get frustrated. That's what I meant about relaxing. Just just take it. Eh? I mm -hmm. mean, so I, I too have been in such a situation where I have never got, got my change back. I just go. I let it go. Eh? Okay, I, I do admit I can more or less afford it. The change is usually quite small. I can more or less afford it. There's a fa fascinating thing I must uh, tell you, Ulrika. Sometimes in within the bus, the minibus especially, two or three passengers don't have their change yet. So then the, the bus conductor tells them, I'll marry you, that which means that um, the, he joins the passengers together with, you know, without them knowing. So we get off the bus and we then have to now find the change amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. So he says, then I'll, I'll marry you, I'll join you together. It's so funny. Huh? So these are the kind of things going on. But then I just relax. And some years ago, I, it happened to me again. And I think the change was maybe about 50 cents. And it was the lady and me who got off and we didn't have, we didn't have a change. So then I just told her she, she should keep it. And there's, there's, no, there's no problem for me. So these are the kind of things which are constantly um, going on. Uh. Worse is actually um, the traffic. Sometimes you get, especially now we, um, we used to have, we still do actually, uh, we used to have motor, motorcycle taxis. And they sometimes come on the pavement where we, the pedestrians are walking on, they can even knock you over. And this can be mm -hmm. really stressful. Huh? But even that, you, you really have to learn how to move and accomplish, um, move with. And recently, again, I was there um, last year with um, two um, very good friends um, from here, from Berlin. And they too, then they learned also to relax. So we were walking within this, the, the motorcycles coming at us or um, going past us. You just relax. I mean, all the time looking, though, that they don't run you over. Of course, yeah. that is very important. But some people really, really get upset, you know, all kinds of things. You can experience this constantly every day. Yeah. So this image was um, taken, so I, I said, to 2000 in Lagos at the coronation of the king of Lagos. He's still um, the king of Lagos. Um, all over Nigeria, we have kings and queens of especially um, big urban centers. Huh? So too in Lagos. Huh? This has been going on for about two, three hundred years. Huh? So when a king um, passes on, dies, the next king will come then into um, to his his um, onto, onto the throne, and will be coron um, uh, there'll be a coronation. So this was the day of the coronation, and I happened to be in Lagos at the time, so I went along to, to for the um, festivities, and fortunately got in very close. This was especially in Isaleko. This is right in the in the um, in the inner depths of Lagos Island. And um, the king is here. This this is the king here with his um, uh, uh, comm comm commemorative umbrella. It's a sign of his kingship, so to speak. Around him are these men who are who, who are his entourage, his um, his um, court, so to speak. And the young boy here as well. And you see the king holding, uh, or one of them is holding his staff. The king also is holding a staff here too, as well. So this was, a, for me, a very fortunate moment that I was able to be in Lagos at the time and also to photograph this particular situation. Yes, and I also am wondering a little bit about, um, I know that you are interested in how spirituality and religion sort of uh, affects urban landscapes. Of course, uh, people themselves, you know, all of us, but uh, how they manifest in public space as well. Mm -hmm. um, Very much so, um, Ulrika. And in fact, um, I always say that one of the key vibrations, that, or one of the things I try to listen to as, as deeply as possible are the religious, cultural elements which embed us all, all over the world. So now this is very much a Yoruba um, situation. Um, well, yeah. 
or let's say Southwest Nigerian situation. And um, it's very much part of the culture, part of a tradition, and also part of many, many different rituals. So now it comes to a fruition in this particular moment, in this particular image. And I'm trying to take, make an image which hopefully will show something of how we perceive ourselves and move forward. So it's, this will be very similar to, let's say, the coronation of the Queen of England or King of England when it happens in the next time, or things like that. Or, or recently, of yesterday, um, Biden's uh, inauguration. So then, but it's very similar. And that's based on a particular, um, so myths actually of, of, democ of, the, of democracy and then rituals as well and the handing of power and so on and so forth. So this is very much what I'm trying also to show, to say, to take, to make. Important, I think, also in this image are the buildings in the background. And here you see people on looking from above, from the stairway and from the balconies down on the situation. It was very, very crowded. And yeah, I mean, this is, of course, <laughs> Long, long before COVID. <laughs> so this is the kind of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. We will be moving on to look at some images from uh, Johannesburg. Mm -hmm. So we need Lagos for Johannesburg. Um, how much time have you spent in Johannesburg um, photographing? All together, two, three months, not in one go, but in the, on different periods. I had, I think, two residencies there about 10 years ago, 10, yeah, eight, 10 years ago. So 2012, actually, so eight, nine years ago. And um, I really want to go back. I wanted to go back actually last year, but then unfortunately a certain um, pandemic came into being. And maybe this year I'm hoping still to continue the work. It's a, for me, it's one of the most intense cities on the continent because it's, it's a mix of it's a very African city, at the same time very, very sort of Western in the sense that it's taken a lot of its architecture and also its way of being from the United States and from Europe, huh? especially Britain, London. So it's it's a very interesting city for me. And then um, while I was there doing one of my residencies in 2012, I went to Soweto and it's one of the most um, so gentle and quiet areas of the city. Um, in, in Johannesburg, inner city at that time, and still is unfortunately, there's sometimes a lot of petty crime, um, muggings, people coming at you with guns and knives to, to rob you right there on the street, despite um, CCT cameras and so on. And so, so wait to nothing like this. Only at the weekends, then sometimes people drink too much and so some shootings, but otherwise, Soweto was so, and it's a, a big part of, jo of Johannesburg. It's, it's one of the townships in the south, southwest township, Soweto, but um, very, very ordered, quiet, and good. Um, unfortunately, there's some parts of Soweto are, um, what do you call it, um, uh, in, um, in, in formal areas, and it's almost like what you could call slums. Eh? But also, some rich people, some millionaires live in Soweto too. Eh? So mm -hmm. now they have this terrible thing, which I don't like. They have um, what they call township tourism. So, but they also have museums in Soweto uh, com commemorating the uh, uprisings in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So I went to this particular uh, museum. It's an open air museum. And you can see here an image of one of the first um, children shot during the 1976 um, or 1986 or 76, 1976 uprisings of school children who were um, um, demonstrating against the imposition of Afrikaans as a teaching language in their schools. So now you have um, um, tourists, so these, in fact, I think these were German tourists actually, who came to this particular open air museum to um, view these, these um, uh, so, um, artifacts and um, objects. And um, yeah, I mean, you can't, I mean, tourism is, 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 is something for uh, in and of itself. So I think it's good actually to learn about what happened, but also at the time it's a bit um, yeah, problematic. Huh? So I took this image, I'm standing with them, and they didn't know I, I could understand what they were saying. They, I mean, they, were being, they weren't being um, negative or derogatory, they were just taking it in as tourists. Huh? There's a coming with a bus, or wherever they're staying within um, South, um, Johannesburg, into the township, spends a few hours, and then move away again. So I just mm -hmm. took this image. Huh? Mm -hmm. and there's a certain tension, I guess, uh, also in this image. 
you know, due to, uh, um, I mean, due to the fundamental bloody history of uh, apartheid and uh, the discrimination and separation of people um, after, you know, skin color, and then the pr these white tourists looking at the images from the 90, 1976 um, uprising. So there's there's something in the image that is um, yeah it vibrates in a sense, and I also like the fact that there's in the middle of the image is this so it looks like like a white streak or something. I I, I keep on trying to uh, trying to remember what it could be. It might be something from some of of because there are other people around me. Something came into the particular image, or maybe from me. I don't know what it is. And um, like you said, um, Ulrika, I also I tilted the image a bit so to to um, somehow say something about this tension, which I think you are very much are, are right about it. One thing I do realize, though, we, we you can't stop history, and um, over time, what happened, you know, 1976 or what happened even earlier, it becomes you know more and more distant, and we we all move on. Huh? So we have to constantly rework, re-understand, re try to understand what it was all about, but we all constantly move on. Huh? And then other things unfortunately happen in the present day or in the future, which even so, you know, make us even so totally forget what happened in the past. Huh? So it's this image is for me is, is yeah, it's 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 a lot of sadness as well, because people really suffered then. Huh? So um this um <laughs> It's a fascinating um, moment for me because um, downtown Johannesburg um, is um, it's um, very, uh, as I said, um, has it's taken its um, its um, paradigm or its um, way of of the city from the states. So it's a grid. So all the streets are, you know, um, will move from. Um, east to west and north to south in very strict grid. Huh? And at the end of the grid is the end street. So one end, huh? the, it's actually on the uh, eastern end, is end street. And on the other end is another street, which is diagonal, it's called diagonal street. Huh? So an end street always fascinated me for, for it's, it's implied the last street, the end. <laughs> There's no more streets anymore. There were, of course, other streets. Huh? So I and I was living quite near End Street, and from time to time I'd be walking downtown. In fact, towards this high rise in the in the distance. And one day I came across this lady just standing here. Um, I, I suspect she is uh, of the uh, Muslim faith because she was wearing a kind of headscarf. And um, she 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 knew I was taking this photograph, but she stood there, which really made for me the photograph even more um, powerful. And then you see all the um, signage and the um, ed, um, uh, uh, advertising, the traffic lights. And uh, also what I always try to bring into a lot of these my images is the street, uh, the passageway, the street way. Uh. So mm. This is for me very, very important. Uh, this street actually is called Commissioner Street, on which I, we, are, we are standing on. And End Street is then the end of the, of the grid of the inner city. Uh. There's also a bit of a humor because you read End Street, and then you see, you know, the the road leading into infinity in the mm -hmm. image. Yeah, that's the Commissioner Street. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's it's, it's a um, yeah, and I really want to go back because especially on End Street, there were a lot of factory buildings. Um, how do you call them? Yeah, factory loft buildings. Huh? And one mm -hmm. was completely. Um, uh, occupied. Huh? So there were literally hundreds of people living on the, on the different floors all the way up, and it all collapsed. Huh? And I think quite a few people um, passed on that time. It was before my time, so that you had a, a space which was now um, totally um, empty, an empty plot, and next to it, another occupied building again, which I also photographed. Huh? So it's, it's um, Johannesburg is a really, really tough city, still is. And the, in this inner city used to be very, I mean, just mostly white people, no? with a few black people who had to have a pass to come and work within the inner city or work in the flats of their um, of white um, their white um, employers. No? But now the inner city is very black, no? and so this this um, um, change is for me very fascinating as well. Yeah, 
So this was um, 2005, and I was in Bamako to help um, set up the um, Bamako Rencontres, which is a photo biannual. Um, that time I was helping Simon and Jami, who was the um, main curator, and I was there to help him. And I was staying in this part of the um, town, a bit outside Bamako, but within Bamako still, with my daughter, who came along with me. And um, we were going actually to um, for the day's work, and we happened to meet this boy coming towards us and um, dragging his, uh, his um, toy house behind him. Huh? So I quickly um, took out my camera to take make this image with very much aware of the other buildings in the background. So um, for me, this is a, an important moment because it shows how we, all of us, um, how do you say this now? We um, internalize our surroundings. So even as children, we know the importance of the mobile phone today, but of houses, of, of um, things, to, uh, with, things we play with. Huh? So now he's moving his house around like this. For, so, for me, so fascinating. Huh? And this has become a, 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 an iconic image, actually, of, of my Bamako series. Huh? Mm. And it also says something about, I guess, the imagination of children. Mm -hmm. Or uh, I guess the imagination of all of us, because we read the house in the background and the... Uh, and and the I don't know the the box I guess mm -hmm. um, fully um, it it could be read as a toy or perhaps he's imagining it's a dog you don't know um, so when I see this image I'm also thinking about that uh, the potential and the the mad the magic thing that is fan our own uh, imagination very much uh, um, like like you just said so beautifully. The imagination is very much actually um, playing with magic and with this um, so illusion or illumination. Huh? <laughs> it's very interesting. And also sometimes, unfortunately, a new word, or not a new word, but a word which I've been recently thinking about, disillusion as well, so that we somehow, okay, this is quite a upmarket area of Bamako, so you see they're quite modern buildings and so on. But some other parts of the city, they have some very sort of informal settlements again, and then it really gets you, yeah, you, be, you get disillusioned actually with time, especially if you have to live in such informal areas. Eh? So this is the kind of thing. But I like what you said too, because as children, we really let our imagination go in many different ways. Eh? And this is something, again, when the imagination comes together in a particular moment, and like in this image, beautiful. Huh? Yeah. So this one was taken on the way into Bamako from where we were living at that time in 2005. And um, I just happened to be walking past. And then um, I'm always interested in the depiction of um, photographic um, spaces in cities. Huh? So one of my favorite um, images is a photo booth, but this is now a photo studio where you can go in to have your photograph taken, which is depicted on the wall. And um, it says studio, and many people here in Europe read it, read it to go, but it's Togo because the photographer came from Togo. He, he In fact, he came out of his uh, studio space to ask me why I took an image, and we got into conversation. And he then he asked, because I don't speak French very well, so he asked me, where, where did I come from? I told him Nigeria, and immediately his, his face lit up, because at the time, the Togolese national football team was being coached by a Nigerian, so he <laughs> was very happy. So that became a, a, a topic of, of our conversation. And then, um, the, uh, fortunately, again, this is what I call serendipity, moments where in taking, making the image, other things come into being as well. So the um, donkey cart going by. And actually, the, um, these, um, the people sitting on the cart are looking back at a wedding, which was taking place at that particular moment, but behind or at the back of the, um, of the studio. So these are the kind of moments which I find very serendipitous, beautiful moments. And then again, I'm also referencing myself being a photographer, you know, taking photo photographs like um, this uh, portrait here, or this um, sort of 
yeah, so depiction here and the, the, um, the person sitting on the chair there. So this is the kind of thing going on all the time. I just mentioned also they were looking back at a, at a marriage, a wedding, and the, you can see on the image, mariage. It's yet to, yeah, this mariage here, which is actually the wedding. So for me, it's very sort of, yeah, it's a special moment again. So, so in, uh, in your photographs, um, you keep coming back to different uh, uses of photography. Um, in in uh, in cities, um, so this here is a studio uh, photo a studio for photography, but there's also uh, you mentioned the the photo booth. There's uh, this uh, beautiful image uh, from uh, Lagos, from the um, from the embassy area where it says um, urgent photo here or something similar to mm -hmm. that effect. Yeah. So you just just mentioned now as a closing, um, how you how this theme of looking at photography um, sort of came about and um, and if it's a question of asking what photography is? Very much so, Ulrika. I'm constantly looking at photographs and also um, asking myself, what is a photograph? What can it do? What does it say? Can we listen into it? I've read some re a recent text where people really talk about this. You can actually begin to hear the tones embedded in the photograph. And also, um, are, we, are we being del um, um, delusional in the sense that the photograph is just a piece of paper? It's two-dimensional. You can't go inside the photograph. I, though, claim you can. So there are all these things all the time in play, and I love playing with these things. And then, of course, the photo booths, the photographers, I mean, the, the photo studios, this kind of thing, the urgent photo. These are, for me, very iconic photographs and moments because the question comes up again, what is a photograph? So I also like to mention now the, um, the multitude of photographs which we are now fed today especially on the social platforms, so the um, Instagram and all these other platforms. Also, of course, before in the newspapers, on, on, on television, even like films and video clips, these are actually single images, then in sequence, so then it, like moving images, so to speak. And they're so overwhelming that m many of us don't fully appreciate, understand what we're actually seeing, what we're looking at. You are working um, with an analog camera very much uh, perhaps similar to the one you first uh, the first professional camera you bought back in the 70s could you maybe speak to what it is in the quality of um, the black and white image the printed image and the analog camera that you prefer it's the warmth the warmth of the tones especially in black and white um, the, the camera I started off with was a um, 35 millimeter small, um, so small format camera, which is the Olympus. But I, I moved up um, years later to the medium format and now work very much with the Rolleiflex Flex 6x6, similar to the um, Hasselblad, which is very um, well known in um, Sweden. And um, it's, it's my way of working. I, I mean, with younger colleagues, many of them use digital equipment. I'm, I'm fully for it as well. I sometimes also use digital equipment, especially um, commissioned work, but I much prefer the analog um, so way of working. In many ways, it's a bit slower. And um, again, I think it's very much, it's like very similar a bit to vinyl, to, to, to today's um, MP3 and uh, other forms of um, recording and listening to music. So there's a kind of warmth in the analog um, prints. I still work in the dark room and make my own prints. But usually for exhibitions, also the one in faster rust, these are um, inkjet prints. So sometimes I, ha I let my um, negatives be scanned and then um, they'll be printed out. Huh? But for me, analog, um, so equipment and analog prints are for, have something special, but I don't fetishize about it. Huh? I mean, if you want to have things, yeah, so it's, um, it's, it's, an, open, it's an open field. Huh? 